In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Christos Anisti, Christ is risen. It is, a, it is a big blessing for me to be here among all of you, praying with uh, Rabbi Daniel and so many people who I know from, from a long time ago when I used to live here. Today, as we read this gospel, it's a very, very well-known gospel. And it's, it's full of treasures, and, and you could speak about it for, for, for hours, because there's so much in it. The context of the gospel is that as it starts out, it says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. What is he? Why is he saying this? Why were their hearts troubled? This is in John chapter 14. John chapter 13, Christ is telling his disciples that he, that they're going to betray him and that, you know, he's telling Peter, you're going to deny me. And, and all of a sudden they're thinking, if Peter is going to deny you, then what's going to happen to the rest of us? Peter's our strongest. Peter is the one then what's going to happen to all of us? Are we even going to make it? Are we even going to make it to your kingdom? It had to have been such a fearful thing that the disciples are hearing that I've been with you for three years and I'm telling you, you're going to betray me and deny me. I said, who else can be saved? Who else is going to make it? If the disciples who have seen everything that they've seen are going to deny and betray and run away and do all of these things, then who else is going to be? Who can possibly be saved? And the Lord says what? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You know what the Lord is doing? He's giving them assurance of the kingdom of God. He's giving them the assurance and he's telling them, be sure that I have prepared Many mansions, many dwelling places. Who is that for, Lord? It's for you. But, but, but you just said we're going to deny and betray and, and be scattered. And how is all of this? How, how is it going to be possible that I'm going to betray and deny? And at the same time, you tell me what? To believe also in you that what? There's going to be many mansions. How does it come? It says here in the Pauline epistle that we read earlier today, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, having a, He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. He's saying, you have to have faith that I came to bring you with me to heaven. But he says that where I am, you may also be. That you might be with me in heaven. Don't think that Christ came down to earth. He took flesh and he walked on the earth and he did the miracles that he did and he preached the words that he preached and he suffered an unimaginable suffering for you to have no assurance of the kingdom of God. That you would not be assured that you would go to heaven. You say, but but we have so many sins. We have our struggles. Abuna, you don't know what I've been doing. You don't know what's in my heart. You don't know how far I've gone. Christ says, that's why I came. He says, you believe in God? Believe also in me. The one that has shown you love. that The love that you haven't ever imagined that you would see, you saw in me. Do you believe that that same love is going to bring you to the kingdom? He's giving them an assurance of the kingdom of God. Do you have that assurance? Do you feel that as long as I am following the Lord, I'm walking with Him, I am going down that path, yes, I'm struggling, I'm falling and I'm rising and I'm falling and I'm rising. But He says what? You're going to deny me. Okay, Lord, then what? Believe that there are many mansions. And I go to pray, prepare a place for you. He says, for I, I will come again and receive you to myself and there, and that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Listen to what Jesus says. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this is what we want to understand this morning. One time, I was, uh, I was going to a hospital to visit a sick person. It's one of our big hospitals in Virginia. And there's a reception desk. And I said, you know, how do I go to you know, room 385? They said, okay, you're going to go down this hall. You're going to take the escalator. You're going to go through the green building. You're going to see another set of stairs. You're going to take the second elevator. Make sure you don't take the first elevator. I said, what did me? And I'm like, hey, lady, like, I don't know what you're saying. 
Somebody saw my confusion and saw that there's no chance this guy is going to get to the room. And he says, and he says what? He says, come, I'll take you there. So now I don't need to know anything other than I'm going to follow this guy and wherever he goes, I'm going to go. And this is what Christ is saying. He's saying, how am I going to go? Like, how do I do this? Do I go right? Do I go left? He says, look, come, I'll take you there. I only need to follow what? Christ. His steps. His love. His way. His direction. I don't need to know anything else. You know, you think about like the Jews. If you look at what happened in the Old Testament. Christ. Every Jew understood like this concept of the way. It was very, very complicated. God said to Moses, you shall not turn to the right or to the left. You must follow exactly the path that the Lord your God has commanded you. Moses also said to the people, I know that after my death, you will surely act corruptly, turning aside from the way. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. The way was a big deal for the Jews. Christ is saying, look, I'm going to make it very clear. I am the way. As if you were here for the Matins reading, it talks about this concept of abiding in me. When you're baptized, we anoint in three different oils. One is called the simple oil. The second one is called the Galilawan or the oil of gladness. And the third one is the Mayrun. When we anoint with the second oil, the Galilawan or the oil of gladness, what's happening is we are taking a person who is in the vine of Adam. So you're coming from Adam. If you were born with human nature, you're coming from Adam. And so what is flowing through Adam into you? Death. Death. And so what we do in the Orthodox Church is that we take this branch and we do something called grafting. Grafting is a term, is an agricultural term that St. Paul talks about in the book of Romans. He says that you're going to be grafted into Christ. What does that mean? He says that, you, like I want you to imagine grafting, you take off a branch from the dying vine. You have a dying tree. You want to save it. So you break off this branch and you find a living tree. You dig a hole in this living tree. You stick this dying branch into the living tree. And that all that is flowing from the, in this living tree into this dying branch will start to flow and give it life. So it's saying what's happening in baptism is that you are broken off of Adam. You are no longer part of Adam. That when you are baptized, you are grafted into Christ and all that is in Christ is flowing into you. That is how you will endure. And that this is how you abide in me. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, truth cannot be just conveyed in words. Many parents often we tell our kids, you know, uh, kids, you have to do this, this, and this. And the parents say, but dad, you don't do that. And that's the worst thing that any dad can hear from their kid. You say, don't talk to your father that way. Even though they're right. Because truth cannot be something that you just say. It's truth is something that you are. Truth is something that you are. It's something that you follow. It's something that you live. Today we're celebrating the feast of St. Arsenius. When St. Arsenius, he was the teacher of the children of kings and rulers. And so he was living a very luxurious life. And he left this life and he went to the desert. And they gave him some food. And as he was eating the food, he was like picking at his food and pulling away the skin and the shells, whatever. And so the elder monk, the elder monk looked and says, okay, how am I going to correct this guy without embarrassing him? He tells another monk, he says, tomorrow at breakfast, I want you to do exactly what Abba Arsenius is doing. So he goes and he's like picking at the food and he's doing whatever. And the elder monk slaps him across the face. And he says, we don't do that with our food. You thank the Lord for what you have. And so Abba Arsenius saw the example and said, wait a second, I'm doing the same thing. Let me not follow that monk's example. So we have two extremes. We have the example that we should not follow and that's the way of the world. All we do is we are absorbing the things of the world, the news of the world, the fashions of the world, the thinking of the world, everything of the world, that is the wrong way. But the true way of life is that you would follow Christ. See, in what ways? I want you to imagine how Christ loved. 
Did people bother him? I'm sure. Did people poke his buttons? Because every time you, you deal with somebody who, who's angry or who has these things, they say, but this person is difficult or this person is... Okay, but you have to follow the way. The way and the truth of the way that we should live is exactly how Christ loved. That he washed the feet of his betrayers. That he loved his enemies. That he forgave those who persecuted. That is the life, the true way of life. And then he says, I am the life. What is life? In Greek, there's two different words. There's three different words for life. We're going to focus on two. One of them is the one we all know about is bios, which is like biology, right? It's, it's, it's like animals existing, going through the motions. They eat, sleep, drink. That is bios life. But in Greek, when Christ says that I, have, that I am life or that I've come to give you life, is he talking to dead people who, who, can't, who can't see or can't, they're breathing people. And what life are you going to give? He says, I come to give you Zoe life. When God created Adam and he breathed into him life, he breathed into him Zoe, the divine life, that he would be filled with the spirit of God, like St. Cyril of Alexandria says, that he is filled with Zoe life. Adam sinned, he lost Zoe, and he went to what? Bios. Just existing. So many people, in the world are just existing. You look at them, maybe you go to your, your workplace, you go to your campuses, you go to your schools, people are just going through the motions. They're just existing. And so Christ is saying, I'm coming to take you from existing, from bios life, to Zoe life, which is the divine life, the full, vibrant, filled life, that when I feel like I'm living, I am so full, that I am like, so vibrant. Today I want to challenge you today and I want to ask, are you living a bios life or are you living a Zoe life? You see, when Christ came to breathe into the disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit, he blew into them and he gave them Zoe again. That when you were baptized and Abuna blows on you the breath of the Holy Spirit, this baby was born in existence, is now breathed, is given the breath of what? Life. The same breath that God gave to Adam, that Jesus gave to his disciples, the priest breathes into you, that you would be filled with life. How? By abiding in Christ. That everything that I do is Christ. If you look at what the readings of the Holy 50 are, it's saying that all of your sustenance, everything that you have and become is only in Christ. That's why he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of life. He says, I am the living water. Everything that they were sustained by, he's saying, that is me. But you're sustained by your paycheck that comes into the account every, every month or every couple of weeks. That keeps me sustained. That my, my friendships keep me going. That Christ is saying, no, I am the true way of life. I am the way the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father except by me. When you see like uh, a student of somebody who is, you know, being trained. Often when you have like somebody who's studying theology from like a, a special teacher who's like an expert. Or somebody who learned Coptic from one of the, the old people who know Coptic in that way. They start to what? Copy their accents, their message, the way they, 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 they live, their mindset. They think like them. So Christ is saying that if you're going to be my disciple, he says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He's saying everything I say is the way of God. I read a beautiful reflection about Philippians chapter 2, when it says, Who being God did not consider it equality, did not consider it robbery to be called equal with God. Jesus was, because he was God, did not consider it robbery to be called equal with God. But the original translation is not who being God. It says, and then he took the form of a servant and emptied himself and did all of these things. It's actually saying, because he was God. 
He took the form of a servant. The nature of God, the way of God is becoming a servant. It's not because he was God. I'm sorry, it's not because being God. It says because he was God, he took the form of a servant. The way of God is the low way. The way of God is the way of love. The way of God is the humble way, is the I'm sorry, is the forgive me, is the I forgive you, is the way of serving and washing other people's feet. That is the way of God. Jesus, because he was God, because he was God, he had to what? Take the form of a servant and empty himself and made himself obedient even unto death. This is Christ and so this must be you. The true way of life is the true way of Christ. Today, as you go home and you're dealing with somebody maybe that is difficult in your life, or somebody that is challenging you, or somebody that is rubbing you the wrong way, or you go to work tomorrow and that annoying boss or your neighbor, whatever it may be, you say, okay, Lord, because I am abiding in you through the sacraments, you will take Christ into you. He will flow through you physically and spiritually. You become one with him that Christ, like I said in the whole grafting, is flowing through you that what comes out of you is Christ. Today, you are called to only be Christ. That what if I don't want to be like Christ? Then you're off the path. Then you go to bios life, like the animals. At the end of the day, bios is animals. <laughs> like, what are you calling us? What are you calling us? You say, if you don't have Zoe in you, if you don't have Christ flowing through you, through his sacrament, through his Eucharist, through his word, through prayer, you are like bios life, which is the animals. You want to be like the animals? He says, I have come that you might have life. You might be filled. That what comes out of you is Christ. The words that are through you are Christ. The actions that are in you are Christ. The service, the giving, the love, the forgiveness, it's Christ. I would love for our spouses to look to their spouse and say, wow, you've been different lately. You're no longer an animal. You are now Christ. You are no longer bios. You are Zoe. Because you are filled with God. And God is what is coming out of you. The fruit that is coming out of this dying branch that I've always known has been grafted into Christ. And what is in Christ is flowing through me. And that I would become like Christ. This is what he's saying. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except for, by me. I am the true way of life. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Then he was 